Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you are on this fast forward planet, which is still wrapped in a pandemic, which is disrupted by Vladimir Putin's uh, atrocity in Ukraine, which is reverberating through everything from energy prices to uh, food prices. Oh, I see Carl Bergstrom has joined us, is, is in the green room too. Um, this is a special thriving online session of my Sustain What webcast, which I've been doing for almost three years through Columbia University's Climate School. Uh, to me, the social climate, the online communication climate is a fundamental part of thinking about climate or sustainability. Uh, can we have a sustainable relationship with all the around us? Uh, Elon Musk has thrown a giant boulder into the, the global pool of knowledge and, and conversation. Uh, which, as I wrote a month or so ago, could be a good thing. You know, the pot needed some stirring. It's been now his, his uh, kind of rogue behavior and, and uh, his own output is astoundingly nonproductive on Twitter, which is forcing more and more of a migration to this thing called the Fediverse. Uh, this is Mastodonville. Uh, I'm showing you a map here. Uh, it's it's fediverse.observer.map. It's a um, essentially a, a global map of the um, all these servers that are set up, which are linked, you know, or can choose to be linked into a, a, a live network. And we're going to sort of go through this whole Mastodon experience in an informal kind of initial way. This will be a little rough and tumble. For the moment, it's looking like a mantle, which I don't really like to do, but I reached out to a bunch of uh, folks to try to just get the conversation going about what is Mastodon for those who grew up socially on Twitter, uh, what do we do about it? Uh, can, can this be as useful or what are the uses here? You can see this is mastodon.help instances has a, a kind of a live ticker. There's 5 million users uh, 2.289 million users active in the last month. Uh, and there's 472,312,620 published statuses, which I think is like a toot, but I'm not sure. My, my guest here, my first guest is Seth Baum, who is a global catastrophic risk analyst and thinker and doer. Uh, Seth, you could unmute if you'd like. And uh, you, you responded to a piece I wrote about this and uh, and you were diving in yourself. You've created some really cool resources yourself. And I just see, I'll have to say, Carl Bergstrom, who I've known now for a little while through our early days in thinking about the pandemic. Carl, it's great to have you back on. Thank you. Uh, and if either of you wants to reach out to anyone else you want to think could contribute to this live, uh, feel free to pa pass a little message around with that StreamYard link. Um, we're trying to, I, Carl, you really dove in quickly. You're extremely angry at the new owner of Twitter, as I think many of us are, uh, for, 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 for many things. Uh, you've been here and developed a presence on Mastodon quite quickly. Uh, so it's great to have you from the University of Washington. Uh, what's the, it's the UWIC, it's the internet, the group there, the oh, social. Uh, sorry. Um... At the, at the Center for, Center for an Informed Public. At the, at the Center for an Informed Public, yes. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and you know, social media can do a great job of that. It, it certainly can be a very important piece of the picture. And it, and it allows, um, brings everybody into the conversation in an interactive way. And it allows us to hear from voices that uh, we wouldn't otherwise hear from. But you know, then there are the flip sides, of course, that we all spend a lot of time navigating and that... Uh, um, yeah, obviously we're all grappling with right now. Yeah, so Seth, Seth uh, Baum, who got this really started, uh, tell me a little bit about your work in global catastrophic risk. Uh, Carl, you've worked in that too. Uh, you were on part of a big paper on the bit, end, yeah, yeah. end times. Uh, so so uh, Seth, what, what got you going and then brought you into the social web part of existence? Oh, yeah. I, so I work on global catastrophic risk, basically, if it could pose a major threat to human civilization that's that's on our radar. It includes climate change and environmental threats. It includes things like nuclear war, pandemic diseases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I'm active, well, I'm not 
hyperactive on on social media, especially compared to some other people, but a little bit active in order to try to uh, really for two reasons. One is to spark broader conversation about it, contribute my own perspectives to that, but also to learn because my work is very interdisciplinary. And so I benefit a lot from being able to hear, uh, you know, not just read research papers from, from other fields, but also just hear the casual chatter and, and perspectives from people who have backgrounds other than other than my own. And that's something that I, I use the, the social media a lot for. By the way, there's Rebecca L. calling out, calling bullshit. Carl is the co-author of a book. It's an open curriculum online that I continue to share with people. You know, it's aimed at students, young students, but I think anyone could take that digital literacy the course. Um, Thank you, Rebecca. Do that. So thanks, Rebecca, for sure. I should have said I'm streaming via Starlink, Elon Musk's other <laughs> company. Uh, I'm in rural Maine and we're not in a Penobscot territory, Wabanaki, uh, otherwise known as Ellsworth, uh, outskirts of Ellsworth. And uh, we are on uh, a soft line internet. So we have too many trees. So if I fuzz out or freeze momentarily, it's up to whoever else is on screen to keep to talk and, and so fill to in keep the, the conversation going, sure. Yeah, and, you know, it's just one tiny little fragment of the digital divide. That's another issue as well. So, so, um, so, so, Seth, maybe Seth and Carl, let's talk initially about Twitter, which is I know where both of you have been very active, and what has been learned by you so far in shifting some of your social social online consciousness to this platform. Uh, for me, it's been uh, quite a learning experience. Mastodon is different from Twitter in some basic ways. I mean, any social media platform really has two elements. There's the technology, and then there is the social community, the, the culture that can be distinct from, from platform to platform. And Mastodon is different from Twitter on both counts uh, because Mastodon is a, a federation, as they call it, of different servers, each which has its own uh, content moderation policies, also because there are there's no algorithm that determines your your news feed that you get. Um, there's no quote tweeting. That was an intentional decision by the, the people who developed the Mastodon code because they were concerned that quote tweeting would be uh, would result in lots of just people yelling back and forth at each other. And this is something that. Uh, I've found to be much more of a point of emphasis on Mastodon than really any other platform that, that I'm familiar with. This emphasis on civility and keeping the tone down, being widely respectful to people, avoiding uh, presenting content that could be upsetting to people, even in some ways that have been surprising to me. Like they will often encourage use of content warnings to hide things that might be upsetting to people, including things that I, I was surprised by, like photographs of food, right? Everybody posts their breakfasts on their social media, but for somebody with an eating disorder, that might actually be uh, uh, troubling to them. And so there's this degree of um, you know, sympathy and trying to uh, uh, be attentive to, to a variety of people and the, the challenges that they may face using social media that that's on the the cultural side that's been new and different to me and has been a very interesting learning experience and carl you know again you were ferociously active on twitter early on everything from crow behavior and photography to to you know try to cut the misinformation around the pandemic and so much more um just a brief description of your love affair with twitter or whatever, whatever. Oh, it was ever a love affair you know i mean it's it's it was it was very very useful um during the pandemic in particular. I enjoyed it prior to the pandemic just as a way to keep up with what was going on and kind of some uh, areas of science that I enjoyed following, particularly ones where I wasn't most closely uh, you know, affiliated so I could keep up with what was going on in game theory or, or you know, whatever the area was, um, some areas of philosophy of science, whatever. When Twitter came around, it, it, it became the go-to place for sort of coordinating the largest collective 
scientific response to any crisis that we've ever seen. And by one estimate, a third of the scientists um, in the uh, in the uh, U.S. and the EU found in all areas of science found something that they can do uh, in order to um, in order to contribute to the the pandemic response. And so we had a you know a tremendous amount of information flowing through that people were trying to sort among. We were all trying to make sense of things, um, and uh, uh, it enabled us to find one another have this amazing real-time conversation. It was absolutely vital uh, for for the COVID response. Um, you can't do that under a roof where the CEO is actively hostile to right. COVID science. And, um, you know, his, his tweets uh, uh, yesterday about prosecuting Fauci, his tweet today about branch COVIDians, uh, this isn't a place where one can do productive science anymore. So people are, you know, it's a, it's a shame because it was a tremendously powerful uh, tool for science um, and it's been destroyed. On the other hand, it wasn't all Musk. There were a lot of dynamics that were already taking place before he took over the platform uh, where COVID Twitter was changing tremendously. And this may be sort of more of a natural cycle that uh, social media platforms go to immediately upon the sort of outbreak of the crisis, people moved there, there was this intense scientific discussion. But as we moved out of that all, all hands on deck phase of the crisis, you had more and more uh, of the, you know, the people who were, um, you know, sort of the most heavily involved in the research side of public health and virology and immunology and, and uh, vaccinology and so forth, uh, started posting less and less. We heard more and more from people who basically were building personal brands um, as uh, COVID pundits or something like that. And uh, the we also got to a position where the the discussions and landscape became much more divided. They were there was a lot of uh, um, you know uh, became very very polarized. So that uh, many of the leading researchers in in public health and uh, um, and and vaccinology and so forth found themselves being targeted aggressively from two sides. Um, you know, one side they were being called lockdowners and and all of that. On the other side, they were being called minimizers um, for trying to find a way uh, you know that society could move forward. Uh, other than zero COVID. And so there was already um, a, sort of a loss of a lot of the valuable, con you know, uh, some of the most valuable voices were sort of pushed, pushed out by louder uh, voices with less to say. Um, so we were already into that cycle. Um, yeah. I have a little more to say on that, but, I, but I'm kind of going and going. So, yeah, I had, uh, I recently reposted a uh, conversation I had way back in, it was actually 2011 with with uh, Margaret Rubega, who was a professor using Twitter and teaching using the mm -hmm. hashtag bird class. And it was um, with Chris Messina, who invented mm -hmm. the hashtag and others. Yeah. And Margaret said something really, really interesting. Even then, she said about corporate takeovers of platforms for communication, almost being an inevitability. And then that spurs a new that that the the need for this thing that Twitter, Twitter kind of was the incarnation of a of what feels like a need that will yeah. find a find a way. It's kind of like the Jurassic yeah, Park yeah. line, you know. We don't find <laughs> so, nature will find a way, right? Do it, do it yeah, you know. I mean, so many um, aspects of of what all is going on here. I, uh, um, you know. Well, another you know, one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is about the way that we are all we're we're evolved information foragers. We're you know, we've evolved to forage for for food and things like that, but we've evolved to forage for information because that's how we make a living in a complex world by coming to understand our natural environment intimately, but also by coming to understand our social environment, and so it makes us seek out information in many many ways. And as food foragers who've learned how to control their environments, we've created um, uh, junk food aisles in every single store that we walk 
walk through with uh, predictable consequences. And we've, as information foragers and as social information foragers, it seems like we are repeatedly drawn to do something similar. And that's, um, you know, to create these very high volume social media information streams um, that are by design addicting um, and, and have some of these negative consequences. And we go through these cycles uh, with these platforms um, as perhaps they initially are serving some needs well and we succumb. It's not just that the you know ownership gets corrupt or something like that, but it's rather that the culture on the platform evolves and, uh, and, the, and the, the community itself changes in composition in ways that, uh, that, that end up degrading a lot of the value that was originally being contributed. Don't completely understand why or how that cycle works, but it does seem like it's, um, it does seem to happen repeatedly. Well, this is something that is potentially going to end up being different with Mastodon than with other platforms because yep. it's open source. It's not owned by a corporation. There's no central incentive to maximize the amount of time and engagement that people spend on the platform. Right. And so there isn't the, there, there might never be the same dynamic in which uh, the, the content goes in this more highly addictive sort of fashion. And indeed the culture on Mastodon seems to really want to avoid having that. And, and I think even even with the leadership at Mastodon, pre the before, before the Musk takeover of Twitter, Mastodon Mastodon's old. It's been around for for right. however many years, and the impression that I get is that the people who had been using Mastodon all this time, as opposed to you know people like myself who just joined within the last few weeks or so, uh, but the the long timers on on Mastodon had really valued that as an alternative social media space in which they didn't feel that just incessant addictive content, the the highly emotive content with lots of anger and, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, for me, it's honestly, it's been kind of refreshing. It's, it's been very refreshing because I don't like that about Twitter. I, I enjoy the chance to hear from people from different backgrounds and learn, learn things that, that different perspectives, keep up with some news, et cetera, et cetera. But that emotional feeling that you can so easily get from Twitter where everybody's just yelling at each other at the top of their lungs and that's what ends up rising to the surface of the, the content feeds. I, I'm quite happy to not have as much of that on Mastodon. And because of the, the character of the of what Mastodon is, that might prove to be durable even as it scales getting more interest. So I'm showing I'm showing something here that uh, Seth had sent me several links to really interesting resources. This is a GitHub uh, uh, page by uh, Nathan. Uh, anyway, Nathan L. L. E. Lesage, uh, academics on Mastodon, and it it's got amazing. Obviously, this gets to the reality that some people were here for a while, but there, there's just an extraordinary uh, groups. Uh, these are all Google spreadsheets and, and the like, um, anthropology, archaeology, etc. Um, and then there was uh, you've created your own. I think this was your uh, military. I this is mili that. I, my my name is on that list somewhere. I feel bad because I haven't been posting about military stuff very much since joining right. Macedon. But, but, but I I do just, work also on nuclear weapons, and so my name is on that list. Right. So, Carl, have you already kind of developed your own? I think let's let's talk for a few minutes about how to use it and like how you're finding utility there. And then I think I'd like to get to what it needs or lacks. But so what are some of the things that have really turned both of you are just talk a little bit more, Seth, about the resources you've pulled together or how you use it, that kind of thing. Well, the first step is uh, populating your your uh, your world on Mastodon. And the first thing that I did for that was imported everybody who I follow on Twitter, who is also on Mastodon. And there's uh, one or two automated tools to do that. It takes a little bit of effort because you have to download something into a .csv spreadsheet and then upload that into Mastodon. But for me, being 
reasonably computer savvy. It wasn't much trouble, but this is a good example of how it does help to be a bit more computer savvy to use Mastodon. And it's something that for now uh, may limit its total appeal uh, because it, it, you know, some of it takes a little bit more of an effort. It makes sense that academics gravitate toward Mastodon because we're, we're so accustomed to having to deal with these sorts of uh, minor, minor uh, computer headaches. So yeah, I imported everybody I followed on Twitter who's also on Mastodon. I scan through these various lists. And then as I you know, go through on Mastodon, I just constantly poking around for people who have interesting accounts that I might want to follow. For now, I'm keeping a relatively small number of followers just to keep my home feed clean. But at some point, uh, I might try becoming more of like a, a quote unquote power user. And the way to do that is to follow everybody who seems vaguely interesting and then if you want to have a quieter feed, you can make a list within Mastodon that's just for that. You can make a list for uh, any number of different lists you want, however you want to segment things. And that's something that um, uh, I think a lot of people do to help give themselves a more um, uh, diverse curated experience on it. Does that, uh, does a, it, can you, sorry, does that, ahead. does that show up on your, your home page Like it, a, it, like a Hootsuite kind it, of so a menu? You, um, yeah. Okay. So you can see my cursor. I will click on lists. I've actually never clicked on this list button before, but yeah, I don't have any lists yet, okay. uh, but you can create lists. And so if I wanted to say, create a list of climate change people who I follow, if I want to create a, a list of nuclear war experts who, who I follow and so on. And so I can, I can go through that. I just, I, I'm still new. I haven't done everything yet. But this is one of the the built-in tools that is available th to help people um, customize their experience. Well, I'd love it if there was a way to migrate my Twitter lists to these lists. I'll have to figure that out. Uh, Carl, do you have a, have you been able to spend enough time to sort of build your own dashboard? Mental mental dashboard. Yeah, you know, I'm also using? not using. I. I um... I haven't, you know, there is an advanced, if you go into preferences, there's, you can, you can go to an advanced feed that sets up columns that's sort of in the, it uh, looks quite a bit like, um, uh, uh, you, you know, TweetDeck or something like that. If you use TweetDeck, so you can set up columns that are tracking different hashtags, tracking different lists of yours, all of that. I actually don't use that a lot. I actually just typically use the main feed. Um, I, right now, I'm, I'm still kind of, uh, uh, have been, trying to navigate among multiple social media platforms and under, and figure out where I'm going to end up landing. Um, I'd, uh, you know, until recently held out a little bit of hope for Twitter. Um, I, uh, you know, I quite liked the vibe at, uh, and, and some of the features at, at, at post, but I'm concerned about the ownership. Um, so I'm still sort of sorting out how, how all of, all of this works um, myself. There, of course, also with Mastodon, there are a lot of different uh, uh, clients that you can use to, to browse, um, particularly on iOS or whatever. So there's a lot of there's a lot of sorting and customization that's possible. And while that can feel a little intimidating at the start, um, the sort of default ones that you stumble into work pretty well. And then uh, uh, the, the, the option for customization, I think, is is nice. And downstream, as it starts to take um, you know, as it starts to take off, then I think we'll see more investment from the community. It'll become sort of a more of a of a high profile project. This is what we see with a lot of open source development. We could expect to see more investment in the community and sort of interface and 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 uh, um, you know general uh, 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 you know a welcome portal to the entire um, Fediverse and so forth. Is there anything out there? you have seen outside of Mastodon that you feel is now post. I don't really like, I just feel like it's way too much of a backwater of a backwater, mm -hmm. uh, even, even though I signed up there kind of posting there, but, um, but then I was wondering about WT social, you know, kind of the Jimmy Wales. I, I, yeah, asked, I, I, I asked a Twitter engineer who quit recently, who I had on my show, Jim Moffat, um, you know, like what's around. And I said, to me, the perfect thing would be something that's Mastodon-y, but that's integrated. So, 
I, I guess it's okay to have the federations, the, some of which can choose to be independent, but the, to have it built and maintained like Wikipedia is. Like there's something about the Wikipedia model that to me is, seems magical that they finally crossed the threshold yeah, well, it's the only thing that works on the internet. I mean, that's that's what I mean. It's like, so, what is the mag? Is there some magical aspect of that that can be transferred to a self-maintaining, including the code, you know, option? I don't know. I don't know because Wikipedia is rooted around pages that are mostly static. Obviously, there's always some updating, and and part of Wikipedia is creating pages for active current events that are they're updated you know, constantly but for the most part uh, wikipedia you know has a lot of uh, most of the real estate within wikipedia the dust is more or less settled versus social media is inherently the opposite of that yeah. and so it's always going to have some yeah. different dynamics for for that sort of reason uh, with mastodon i think it has potential to be of the the caliber of quality of Wikipedia, though it's that people compare Mastodon to email, right? And that there's a variety of different email servers, each of which has its own policies and procedures and so on, but they all link to each other. So if you have a Gmail account, you can email somebody who has a Yahoo account or, or whatever else it is. Mastodon similar in that regard. Uh, a lot of people are already pretty happy with their experience on on Mastodon. For me, I like it's got room for improvement, but it's it's okay. Uh, and could there be more bells and whistles? Yeah, there's some things that that don't work quite as well. And I think it, there's especially a lot of room for improvement in terms of making it easier for people yeah. to use, especially for for wider audiences to use. But uh, it's it's not terrible. And it's been interesting for me because it's like it's a stripped down kind of streamlined social media experience where it's kind of it is what you make of it as opposed to the the platform the company is presenting an experience to you based on its algorithms and and so on. Uh, it's it's uh, it's just it's a different type of experience that has it has advantages and disadvantages, but. Uh, I expect that I will probably continue to use it moving forward. As a journalist, you know, someone who is trying to find someone like Carl or someone like you, Seth, or someone like Catherine Hayhoe, or someone like uh, the, a scientist I know who only works on landslides, Twitter is still, to, for me, a fundamentally valuable resource that I cannot find a way to use Mastodon to do. Like I use Twitter as a search engine. And yeah. what I like about it is it's real time and it's people for the most part. There's bots, of course, but but if I'm certain, you know, if there was just a terrible landslide in California, there, there were landslides all around the world. I put in landslide and uh, resilience and I'll find people who are working on landslide resilience yeah. as opposed to like going to Google and putting in the same terms and I'll find like papers on landslide resilience, but not it's like two or three steps to finding the person to talk to and learn from. Mastodon search is n not as great, I think, and some of it could potentially be improved with, uh, you know, better better code. Uh, some of it might be an aspect of this uh, uh, decentralized federation that that's just inherent to Mastodon. I mean, a lot of it's it's hard to search across, uh, like if you have an account on one server to search people on another server becomes harder. But there, I, I do agree with you. Part of it is just there aren't as many people there. And there's so many people on Twitter that if you yeah. want somebody who's an expert on, on you know, landslides in Northern Ireland, do they even get landslides in Northern Ireland? I have no idea. But if they do, there's probably right. an expert on them on, on Twitter versus you just you don't have that anywhere else for now. Um, but I also, I think search just doesn't work quite as well on, well, on Mastodon. I, I mean, search doesn't work by design. And, uh, so uh, Mastodon, one of the, one of the concerns about Twitter is the sort of harassment and brigading that happens when people use particular terms in their text. Right. And so Mastodon makes it impossible to do cross federation search unless the, uh, unless the person wants to be found by using hashtags. So um, I can't do a cross-federation search for 
particular text, um, all I can do is search cross federation, you know, cross federation for hashtags. So I can only search the current server that I'm on for text. I have to, if I, have, I can't, I can't search all the other servers. And and the idea is is that you know one of the things that was you know particularly noxious, climate, climate scientists have dealt with it for a very long time. We dealt with it during the COVID pandemic. Was the way that you would uh, type the you would you know type uh, um, you know uh, uh, the uh, the you know, just type the word vaccine or something like that yeah. in a thread of yours, and uh, you get a hundred people calling you a child murderer um, because you were discussing the Moderna vaccine efficacy, and um, so Mastodon makes it much harder and to behave that way. Um, may, you know, could the, the, the quote tweet is part of that, and then the lack of search is part of that. So, um, some of that is is deliberate. And then, if you want to be found, of course, you can use these hashtags. Problem is, it the hashtags do hurt readability. I haven't really gotten used to them. I don't really like them. Um, maybe I'll eventually learn how to use them, but uh, um, it certainly it certainly takes some takes some learning effort. And then, if we have time later on the show, we can talk about some of the um, sort of profound. Uh, vulnerabilities of mastodon to uh to intense brigading and harassment um because it's not as pretty of a picture as it's often painted oh that's interesting well this is a good time to talk about some of the downsides you know as i mentioned search is one of my bugaboos um and well, I, think, you know, I mean one of the things is that uh the notion of trying to moderate a federated platform is really different than the notion of trying to moderate a um uh a single uh, united platform like Twitter. And so one of the one of the sort of, you know, founding principles of Mastodon is that anyone should be able to spin up their own instance. I could spin up my own, um, my own little, it's my own little server, my own little node in the in, the, in a federation, call it an instance. Um, and, uh, and then I could join the federation and then I could be found. Um, and so the idea is I spin that up and then I can just, and then I'm sort of, I, I can sort of interact with other servers uh, and I'm sort of, uh, trusted by default. Um, and the problem is, and, uh, you know, this has been particularly noxious for women and people of color and, 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 uh, other, um, you know, um, often targeted groups, uh, is that, um, is that there are a lot of servers out there that are sort of little, uh, you know, self-contained, uh, white supremacist servers or Nazi servers or, or just uh, you know really really nasty troll servers um, that will uh, that will find users, um, target them, and uh, just unleash really horrible venom. Lots of lots of death threats, lots of anti-Semitic stuff, lots of you know uh, extreme racist content, that kind of thing. And it all gets dumped into your feed once they find you. Now the approach of that is that the the uh, the admins for each individual instance in the federation are supposed to find these servers and block them, but it doesn't happen fast enough. Um, you know, there's some sharing of of block lists and and the likes, um, but it's quite quick and easy for when once one of these instances gets blocked, it's quite easy for them to register a new domain for six bucks spin up a new mastodon server and um you know with this with this old users and do it all over again and uh so you know one of the things that i find really frustrating about mastodon is that this sort of uh um uh you know honestly you know largely white male tech bro approach about how you know everybody should have the ability to to run their own server on their own computer and be able to instantly reach the entire federation trumps the safety of uh of people in marginalized communities um and they say oh well you know you just have to deal with them once and then it gets blocked but this completely undermines the uh the psychological toll that it takes to receive a barrage of death threats after my new york times piece came out um i was targeted heavily by some nasty nazi servers um, and right. even in my position, uh, you know, I found that really unpleasant and, and it was nasty to a degree that I never experienced even in the worst of times on Twitter. Uh, and that's a wow. very common experience. I've shared that experience with, uh, you know, with a number of people who've moved to Mastodon, 
um, and uh, and have high profiles for various reasons, uh, particularly people in, in marginalized communities. Well, so until, until, the, until the platform, until the Federation deals with that issue, um, it's just not it's not going to be the safe space for everyone that it is for cishet white men. So who is the Federation? Like, how does that function as a deciding force on something like that? I mean, I think that uh, I, I don't know enough about the, the the politics of all that to be able to comment. I mean, partly you've got someone on here who's not really an expert talking about it. And I, yeah, I but we're all, us, we're all users. And I think this I'm is I'm just good. trying to share my experience with this. Yeah. But, but I mean, I think there's, you know, there's, there's partly a set of norms about when when someone spins up a new instance, what are the norms that that instance has about whether to trust other instances, right? Mm -hmm. And so right now the norm is is innocent until proven guilty, and um, and and while that is admirable in some ways, it simply doesn't make the Fediverse safe for certain people. And uh, you know, again, there have been I'm not going to mention names. They can share their stories. You can find it if you search. Some of them have shared their stories quite vocally on Twitter. Um, but uh, but I'll let them do that. And it, it the, the the toxic abuse is out of this world, um, and it, it's coming from a minority of servers. It is not you know Elon Musk you know cheering on the the big right wing accounts. It's a bunch of kids in somebody's basement um, mm -hmm. writing hate speech because they think it makes them cool. But it's has a devastating effect on some of the recipients. <clears throat> this is so. This is a corner of Mastodon that I, fortunately, have not yet had the uh, uh, misfortune of being exposed to. But uh, it it only makes sense to hear you describe it. I'm trying to imagine. So, like, how could this type of problem be solved and one would be to you had said like you know innocent until proven guilty you could have it you could flip it around where servers instead of being automatically federated the admins of a server would have to approve it first i have no idea if that's something that's a, a possibility with the existing i mean i think that would be the sort of thing you'd do right, right? is that this server wouldn't be approved until um someone trusted from your server had interacted with someone from that server and mm -hmm. then you could expand out slowly but the you know what i've been told and when i've tried to talk about this as well that goes against the um entire point of the fediverse which is that anyone can spin up and join instantaneously um and i think there are just there's you know there's there's some fundamental trade-offs that we're probably end up having to face between this you know sort of you know me being able to tinker and set up my own server on uh, on this machine that i'm sitting here right at right now um uh, having the freedom to do that versus other people having the freedom to be able to come over here and uh, not be, uh, you know, subjected to death threats. Yeah, well, I and could imagine a server or, or several servers that uh, exist with this sort of policy as a means of uh, helping protect their users from this sort of harassment, and especially if you have larger servers, then they can you know, raise the funds to hire content moderators. Yeah, I hate this idea. I mean, people have suggested this. And I don't want to, you know, the reason I don't like this idea is that this is ghettoization. It says, hey, look, you know, you're LGBTQ. Go over to this safe space for LGBTQ people. Mm -hmm. um, guess which spaces get attacked first? But if you have, so there's there's like uh, uh, the big one, I think, is Mastodon.social, sure. which is just a, a big general purpose server. And so if you have a big general purpose server that's for everyone, but also has a strong moderation policy, and because it's so big, you get some economies of scale, you can maybe like hire a, a, a content moderation team I mean, that kind of that thing works. then starts to more vaguely resemble a, a more centralized platform like a, a Twitter um, but it's still part of the, the Fediverse, as they call it, and could uh, you know, still uh, partner or, or, or federate, I guess, with, with other servers, but on a more restricted basis in order to avoid the, the sort of problem you're describing. Uh, what, yeah, I mean, I think what do so, I know? I'm not, I'm not yeah. part of this. The, right, me this neither. Is, uh, I mean, this uh, is going to be enormously involved, frustrating but... to people that are actually deeply involved in Mastodon hearing us yeah. try to explain what what's yeah. wrong with it and what they ought to do about it because what the hell do I know? But yeah, um, same. yeah, I did reach out. I did try to reach out to people who are more, you know, at the core of it and maybe we'll do a follow-up uh, 
yeah. session of assembly. But, but I do, I do just want to bring that up because uh, yeah, it's an important uh, point. I have had a number of colleagues who have been persistently targeted, you know, for a number of years on Twitter, who upon moving here receive much worse content than they've received anywhere else. And I experienced it myself after the New York Times piece came out. And, and I just uh, I just want to get a sense of why you think there is more of it here. I just just remind me, repeat uh, again on, what that's on about. Twitter, um, on Twitter, you can't just infinitely spin up new uh, new racist accounts and 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 um, attack people with them. I mean, you got to have a you got to have an ad, an email address, and I think I don't know whether you need a phone number these days or not. But on Mastodon, I can I can go. I could, you know this afternoon I could go register. With, you know, I could take a hundred bucks, go register, or, or sixty bucks, go register ten domains, spin up a server on each of those domains give each of a hundred friends a handle on each of those servers. Um, and now we've got a thousand uh, accounts that are spewing Nazi hate speech um, at whatever designated targets that we've chosen. Um, they shut those down overnight. I do it again the next day. Wow. That's, that's discouraging. But again, this is, so uh... we got to find a, we got to find a solution to it, right? It's like, it's one of these things where when Mastodon small, um, it's not a big problem. As Mastodon gets bigger, you have some high-profile accounts that have been targeted by the by the far right for a long time. Come over here. Um, now you got to solve this, or those people say, "Look, I'm not safe here. I'm not going to be here." And that's what's happened today. Hmm. I, I'm curious about it. Whether there's um, in the early days when I did my dot Earth blog at the New York Times, you know, it was a WordPress blog within the Times thing, and there the commentary got it never got hateful but you know for some people it was problematic there were people who were you know totally rejecting global warming uh who were um very pest pesty you know sure. repeatedly posting and so someone came up with an external filter called dot earth defender mm -hmm. that allowed that allowed you to come to the site and like have a cleaner view of it i, I still don't know how that works but but i didn't know in this case is mastodon set up in a way that allows a um uh, you, you know that apps can be developed that, that or does it all have to happen on in no the I mean, it's, it's definitely set up that people can modify it in all kinds of ways i don't know if it'll solve this particular problem unless you take it i mean i think there's a i mean unless you unless you take a you know extremely strong filtering appro approach toward language and then people can work their way around that by using alternative spellings and these kinds of things um, I mean, the bigger problem is just the ease with which um, accounts that didn't exist five minutes ago are given full reach into the Fediverse yeah. um, and that these can be created at scale. Yeah, so here's another. Rebecca L. has come in with an, another comment. I like the instances for reducing toxicity, but the other side of the coin for us may mean extra effort to communicate outside our science-based instances to reach the general public. I guess this... You know, I keep getting the sense that this is a sort of right tool for the job question. You know, for some things, Twitter yeah. really is un yeah. is not replicable, and for other things, for more of us, I kept thinking of somehow Mastodon. At least to the extent I've seen it so far, is more like Slack, though. It's like mm -hmm. a oh, almost, yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's an important distinction to make. Like, so for me personally. I think of social media as playing two different sort of roles. One is just casual conversation amongst uh, uh, not, not just peers, but wh whoever wants to participate, who, who has interesting things to chime in on. And it's much, and it doesn't have to be casual, it can be professional, but it's a smaller conversation. You know, me socializing among other people who I enjoy socializing with and uh, maybe getting some news along the way or, or something like that uh, versus something that's much more akin to broadcasting. And, you know, this is right. the, the influencer role on social media. And I have been enjoying Mastodon for the, the former role, the, the more just socializing role. I don't know about it for, for the latter role. And I think there may always be limitations for it in the, um, uh, the former role, or excuse me, for the broadcasting role one, because I doubt it's ever going to get a huge uh, user base, like a, a, a just hundreds of millions or billions of people user base because it's not as user friendly 
uh, and maybe for some of these other uh, content moderation sort of reasons. Uh, and so it, and, and also because search doesn't work as well, discovery doesn't work as well, things of that sort, it may never be a great platform for broadcasting. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but for having your own quiet little corner where you can socialize, uh, it, it's worked okay for me. I definitely appreciate that for other people, the experience has been much less pleasant. And hopefully there are ways for uh, that type of problem to be solved within within Mastodon. But it might just be you know a tool for a certain type of job and, and less of a tool for, for other types of jobs. And just, just to repeat, this is Andy Revkin of the Columbia Climate School. This is a, sort of a live discussion of a thriving on online discussion of w what to make of Mastodon, what role can it play in fostering the kind of connectedness and uh, creativity and engagement that we've all come to take it, take for granted for a certain extent uh, on the internets. Um, and I have here Seth Baum and Carl Bergstrom. I had tried to, you know, I, I cast a pretty wide net here and Normally, this is a diverse program, but uh, if you look at the overall scope of our program, it's not just white guys like us. Um, and uh, I want to ask you guys a question because you both do think about catastrophic end time questions. Uh, Car actually, Carl, I still want to do an episode on that paper you were part of. We I'd love to. That'd be great. We could bring some of the other authors on. It'd be fun. Could you describe it for a second? Because Seth is right in that same ballpark. Sure. Um, you know, our, we're talking about the way that um, that global information flows have been radically changed in the last 20 years. We have, you know, we have this the species where these evolved information foragers that uh, um, that that, uh, you know, evolved to make collective decisions um, over evolutionary timescales over billion, millions to hundreds of thousands of years over cultural timescales of, of millennia then you completely change the scope, scale, fidelity, uh, connectivity of global information flows uh, via first connecting all the computers in the world together and then, then inventing social media. Um, and that changes the kind of information that people get, what they believe about the world and ultimately how they make collective decisions. And so we know a fair bit about how sensitive collective decision making can be um, in, in animals, for example, to issues of uh, scale and connectivity um, and, uh, and, and the way that uh, the equivalent of misinformation can spread in those structures. So our thinking is essentially that if we want to be able to solve any of the problems that require people to have access to uh, reliable, um, accurate information about the world, that would involve, you know, we, we need to figure out well, how do we how do we get them? And, and, so, and so, you know, that's that's everything from from climate change to dealing with pandemics to racism, war, whatever it is. Um, we have to figure out, you know, uh, how do people get accurate information? What what uh, how do we deal with disinformation and misinformation problems? Um, and uh, and and to understand that, we'll have to figure out what it is that, you know, we need some theory about uh, what these radical changes a lot of which are opaque because we can't actually see um, either what the you know, underlying algorithms are or see the patterns of information flow. That's all uh, stored away. We you know, work very hard to get access to as much of that as possible, but largely we can't see it. Um, yeah, you know, we, we, we need to be able to s start understanding what social media is doing collectively to our understanding mm -hmm. of the world, how that changes the decisions we make. And so we're asking for, you know, essentially that we're proposing that we need a crisis discipline um, to understand uh, uh, you know, global information flow and uh, human collective decision making is sort of an analog of, of, you know, say, climate change to uh, earth sciences or something like that. Seth, I know that intersects with your work. So had you followed this? I do think the urgent emergent nature of this arena seems to be deeply consequential you know technology communication technology has also always been used for bad or for good not just hitler uh, rwanda and all the way back uh, the incident that i always think about is the telegraph uh, it was one of the things that fostered the extinction of the passenger pigeon because people were telegraphing back home from the midwest mm -hmm. the pigeons are in and people would get on trains with guns. And <laughs> so it's, it's like, 
so but now it's global and instantaneous you know so i i do i do latch on to what carl's talking about what it's it was obviously a, a big issue something that i've observed is over the last few years when the pandemic started uh colleagues of mine in biosecurity found themselves flooded or, or dealing with floods of misinformation and harassment and so on and i remember uh, my climate change colleagues were basically saying welcome to our world sorry you know let us know if we can help talk you through some of this and then this year my nuclear war colleagues have had to deal with the same thing yeah. that, that nuclear like nuclear weapons twitter used to be its own kind of quiet little corner of of the social media space and and with uh, the war in ukraine that's completely blown up and and they've had to deal with some of the same and it feels fairly inevitable to me that as a topic area uh, takes center stage within the public attention that it's it's going to have to deal with these sorts of issues, and then um, uh, this can this can absolutely affect decision making. But how it affects decision making varies from issue to issue. So nuclear weapons is a good example where a large portion of the most important decisions are highly centralized at the, right. the heads of state, and so the spread of disinformation can affect who gets elected to be the head of state and, and who, who those people are surrounded with. It can affect what the public pressure is, but those who are in the room making the decisions do have access to really high quality information. And as long as we elect reasonably capable people should be able to cut through the disinformation and, and figure out what's really going on, except there's you know, different types of disinformation, like is the adversary trying to deceive you? But that's, that's always been but that's, an, that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to intervene because uh, Jim Moffat, who was a Twitter engineer, until was it four weeks ago now, Jim? Uh, he worked uh, very hard on building the API accessibility and utility for real-time emergencies, particularly flooding, uh, mm. you know, flood maps and stuff. So, Jim, uh, how are you doing? First of all, I'm doing well. It's been uh, since November 17th when uh, I did not check the magic box uh, in the Elon Musk email. Um, yeah, things are good, and I'm, uh, I've been playing with uh, Masternone and just checking out their API, um, trying to make my own assessment if it's in a position to somehow replace Twitter in terms of the use case I care about, which, yeah, is, is all about weather notifications. Yeah. And uh, what, have, what have you learned? Well, I mean, fundamentally, one of the big challenges is just how it's federated. I mean, you could have people on one server community not knowing what's going on on another. Uh, maybe there's potential. Maybe there already exists a group that's dedicated to weather notifications, but that would not be the same community of what's just on Twitter, right? I mean, you'd have to be pretty motivated to go find that server, get involved with it. Uh, in terms of the API, yeah, I was able to make a request and, um, um, you know, post something. Uh, what I didn't find was some sort of search capability. You can search on users, I think, across different servers. Hmm. But, you know, the thing, the magic of Twitter, in my mind, for weather stuff was your ability to listen in real time for you know, maybe it's a hashtag around a hurricane or, or certain phrases about floods or storms. Um, I don't think they have that yet. Well, it would be interesting to, to know if they, that can be sort of opened up a little bit. Um, have they done, do they even have, let me go to their, um, I was on Mastodon's homepage. Oh yeah, do they have a, an API kind of a how to? Yeah, I did. was able to find some documentation. Actually, a colleague, a former colleague, um, turned me on to it. There is some page where it kind of um, itemizes what the different, what we call endpoints are. Um, th but I, I didn't find it that intuitive when I first jumped in. I mean, maybe I'm biased because I helped write a lot of the Twitter documentation. But in terms of getting started, like, you know, there's key things you need to get going with right away. And those are like authentication tokens and you know, how do you generate these things? How do you regenerate them if they get somehow published, et cetera? Um, one thing you said to me that was so important in that previous webcast, I'm really glad you popped in here, 
uh, you were talking about how how many years and how many person hours, how many programming hours and regulatory work went into building Twitter so far and how, how hard it would be to replicate that. That's doable. But as you look at the back end of Mastodon, are you, do you have a sense of like where it is on the the trajectory toward being more full fledged? Well, you know, I, it's probably fair to say I haven't dug in that deeply, but I will say it is open source software. So the potential there for it to be built and added on to by committee is is, is real. Um, but yeah, I mean, the history of the Twitter API is, you know, well over 12 years old, um, kind of grew organically. Uh, and then, you know, we were right in the middle of releasing a new version two of the Twitter API, both for publishing, but also what I refer to as the listening side of it. And to do all the other things that you want to do with the API. I worked with a lot of partners who kind of built their own third party clients and they want to be able to do things through their interface, just like you could on Twitter, like muting accounts or liking accounts, adding users, whatever. Um, so 12 years of history there and about two years of history on building the Twitter version two, the uh, Twitter API version two. Um, for me, that's that's the sad part for me is like we were just, uh, it hit this cadence. We, we had rebuilt a lot of the back end, all of the complicated things about th authentication and, and, you know, it's, Posting a tweet is really complicated. Um, there's a famous schematic, the life cycle of a tweet and just all of the back end services that support that effort. I mean, it's all, you know, different levels of privacy. You may have a protected account. So when you post a tweet, it's only visible on some small percentage of feeds. Um, not to speak of the complications of like when Elon Musk tweets, that tweet gets, you know, uh, fanned out to over 120 million different timelines. I mean, there's, wow. it, it, in my mind, I was never like a front end developer of that system. I'm more of a developer advocate in support of it, but really in my mind, it's like, that is rocket science. It was a lot of really good engineers, uh, figuring out how to solve these challenges. Wow. Well, um, uh, where where do we go from here? I'd like to do another session. We're almost at the end of an hour here. And I, I do want to build in more voices and more uh, verse, diversity. And But keep this as a track. This might be a track going forward. As I, I did a series of about three dozen episodes, what I called Thriving Online, because I'm still convinced it's possible. <laughs> um, and I think we need to learn more about Mastodon. I'll try to get a couple of the key people on here. The other, the other thing that came up earlier, Jim, here that we also talked about when I asked, uh, is there a Wikipedia model for this? Like where you get a lot of people kind of working on something that becomes self-sustaining, self-regulating, but is open. And I, I'd like to see if that, that vision can kind of come forward a little bit more. Is there anything else you guys would think we should pursue what you know if we do a session two here what would it be like there's always more that could be talked about but one uh, other thought is that if uh, for for these various reasons that we've discussed mastodon is is not the solution to all of these problems that we see a need for a solution for and if twitter continues to to go in a problematic direction then that creates a void that intuitively I would expect to be filled, whether it's filled by something that already exists or by something new that, that might come into existence. I mean, the, the, the demand is there, the engineering talent to build the platform obviously still exists in the world. And so perhaps a year from now or maybe five years from now, we'll all be on some platform that, that's off our radar at this point. And yeah, I mean, I'm not done with Twitter. I, I hate, the current owner's approach to it. I think it's, 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 it's really super toxic, but I can't not live without as a journalist for sure. And a communicate sort of a community builder without that real time, full search um, capacity, which exists there beyond everything he's trying to do. Especially an active use is what I, you know, don't go there and rely on your feed unless you want to be fed. 
Yeah. If you if you go in there with an active purpose, I think it can really be a good place. So so any maybe uh, Carl and and uh, what's your kind of go away takeaway point? I'm done on Twitter. You know the um, yeah. last couple of days was just was just too much. You can't do science under a roof where the uh, people in charge are actively hostile to what you're doing. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and so it's not a place for, it's not a place for science now. Um, yeah. so I'm gone, um, you know, couple it with the, uh, the, you know, somehow managing to, you know, in five words, couple that with dog whistling to, uh, to the transphobes and, and, uh, other bigots out there. It just, it's, it's yeah. not a place that, that, I, that I find viable. I don't have an alternative home. I've got, you know, I'm posting to Mastodon, but it, doesn't seem like everything I'm looking for. Um, I'm reluctant to jump ship to post because I don't know, you know, uh, Mark Andreessen and others have shown every ability to be the same kind of techno libertarian billionaires, albeit not quite as kooky as, as, as Musk. So uh, I do want something community owned. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to see what develops. And any, any last thoughts from either Jim or, Carl and Jim, thanks again for jumping back in. Yeah, I mean, it reflects my uh, my addiction to Twitter still. I was just looking at my feed and <laughs> saw, you, you saw, my... saw the link. It's like, okay. Um, yeah, I just got into post. I mean, you know, I was on the waiting list, but I haven't had the time lately to, to really dive in. And um, yeah, it's curious to hear Carl's impression of like who's behind that because um, admittedly I'm a little naive about who's building that. Um, yeah, I'm hopeful for some new uh, resource that's, you know, brings the qualities of Twitter that I admired, the public nature of it. And really, for my use cases, the real time nature has to be like front and center. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying them all. But I, yeah, I'd be, be curious in your thoughts, you know, as we wade through the next few weeks of what's out there. But obviously to rebuild a Twitter, I think it's a much bigger effort. I, I do too. Um, and I, well, I, I know the issues that Carl brought up about just the fundamental ethics of a platform that's so hijacked. There's, you know, that's, that's, that, that's an important point to, to consider too, but I'm still hoping there may be a way to flood the zone with enough productivity, connectivity that it can be, sustained through whatever this moment is. I, this is the last thing I want to ask you, each each of you, because you all think at the scale of longer than just today and this month. Um, what's your... Th I had this thought over a decade ago that the internet as we knew it, the social web as we knew it, was so new. This gets to Carl's point about the crisis uh, discipline. That it's like the early days of something, the noise and the turmoil are my, my hope is that they're transitory. It's like the initial moment of the, um, when, the when the printing press happened. Uh, there was a woman at Harvard who wrote something ages ago about how we think, you know, we are in, this is the first time society has faced information overload. And she, her, she went back through history and there's been all these moments. So is this a moment like leading toward a cleaner, neater, way to use these the miracle of connectedness or is this the end times <laughs> so maybe seth carl and and jim and then we'll get out of here well i don't i don't think this is the the end times per se i mean the world uh, you know human civilization is not going to collapse just because our, our social media is, is even messier than than it had been before there's just too many other factors at, at play here that said it you know, social media has the potential in, in its best form to be a major part of the, the solution instead of being part of the problem. And, you know, it's all what we as, as a, a global society make of it. Um, and so hopefully this can, we, we can come out of this with, with something good, whether it's Mastodon, whether it's using Twitter. And I don't begrudge people for, for continuing to use Twitter. 
uh, even under all, all that's been going on. It's just a tough judgment call that I think everybody needs to make. Uh, there still are good things that can be done within the, the context of Twitter. Uh, but you know, who knows where this, this could be moving forward. Things like this have happened before. Think authoritarian governments that just shut down entire social media platforms, even on a moment's notice. And so everybody just gravitates to, to somewhere else. And you know, that's not without uh, some, some loss and some disruption. But you know, as long as people are out there trying to connect with each other and talk with each other online, there's always going to be, I think, some other space to do it, however clunky that may be. And does that, uh, Carl, you sort of, again... Is, yeah, and I think, you know, I, you know, Corey Doctorow made a really nice point in an essay um, that, that, that he wrote recently, which was uh, that, um, you know, that, that, that social media networks generate a lot of surplus for users or for advertisers um, because of the network externalities and network effects that are involved. Uh, people can't leave easily, and so uh, you don't have a system of perfect competition. So the people running social networks can give most of that uh, surplus to advertisers. That is, make the platform relatively unpleasant for you um, to sell ads better and better. Um, and in fact, they do well to do so um, as long as they, you know, don't push you past the point that you're willing to leave. But the point is that uh, is that they they do move you quite close to where you're near willing to leave. Um, and, and it's sort of the, you know, the shittification, I think, was that was might have been the term that I think it was from that essay, but it may have been somewhere else of of social media platforms um, uh, leave them in positions that they are vulnerable to shocks. So you have a shock. Um, and if the if the entire surplus that was being generated by the social media platform were going to the users, then it would be very robust to that shock. But because of the shitification process, um, users are close to indifferent about staying anyway. Um, and so uh, when you get a shock, you can easily get a rapid, uh, a rapid shift. Um, I'd, I'd be looking for those shifts in the, in the months and weeks to come. Well, thanks. And Jim, Jen, uh, last, last thought from you. you. Yeah, it's just such an interesting topic. I mean, I, I've felt conflicted with my tenure at Twitter from the start, like I came from science and flood warning and went into a, a social media company, like, what am I doing? Um, I don't know, I'm so conflicted by the potential of this, you know, the public square. I, I love that concept. I love this place where you, anyone can post and, and you know, it's not just the press or, you know, the elite. Um, I love that. But also as a father of two daughters who are now, you know, young adults, uh, I've always, you know, been aware of the, the ugly side of social media, especially on kids. So I, I have no answers here. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, the best things of Twitter, you know, the real time nature, the public nature. I mean, Twitter takes a lot of work. When you first join Twitter, you have to kind of curate, obviously, uh, your timeline. And a lot of people, I don't think, spend a lot of time doing that. Um, but I think it's very necessary or it's just can be a terrible experience. Um, yeah. And there's also the thought that Twitter like almost became like a public utility. And how do you separate that from private ownership and the need to sell ads? And um, But it was interesting that during my tenure, like Twitter... I don't think was ever truly understood by Wall Street, yet it had become this public utility that people kind of uh, leaned on and, and depended upon. So, and here we are today with new ownership and <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, I'm gonna be dabbling because, you know, I'll still be driven by this flood warning like mission and use case I've been focused on forever. Uh, and and I'm very much looking around to see what could what could be an alternative? Yeah, and I, I, I think to me, I started thinking of Twitter as a function. It's like get get rid of the idea of this platform of Elon's business. Twitter is a it's a it's a it's a function. It's a thing that can happen somewhere. And so, thanks for being here. I uh, all of you to say as an evolutionary I'm, biologist. I'm just popping. Um, oops, sorry. I'm going to close it. This is like 30 seconds. Uh, this is Mar Margaret Rebega.
UConn professor in this from this dialogue I had a long time ago. I think it was 2013 when I was at Pace University, and she says this thing about sort of the inevitability of something like this, and about co-opting like what what our friend. Uh, Elon has been up to an evolutionary biologist. Um, I think that um, that patterning of how you know communication technologies arise and then get co-opted and then get tied up by commercial or corporate interests or governments. Um, you know the the part that that doesn't get said maybe or or is sort of in the background is that. As soon as that happens, people begin looking for a different way, and eventually they create something else. There, there's, there's always something new in order to achieve that thing that people want, which is the freedom to create their own their own way of interacting with one another. Yeah. So let's keep that up, right? I think the conversation we're having is that we're all trying to work to enable whatever comes next, wherever it happens, whether it's on uh, uh, Mastodon or Mammoth or or uh, YouTube or Reddit uh, or, um, oh my God, LinkedIn, never. Link, but let's just keep at it. Thanks so much for being here today. Carl Bergstrom, thanks for popping in. Really happy you could do uh, that. You. Seth Baum and uh, Jim Moffat, uh, AKA Snowman, keep up the good work on the uh, Twitter and or other things as a flash flood awareness uh, mechanism. This is Andy Revkin at Columbia Climate School coming to you from via Starlink from rural Maine. And uh, we'll keep at this too. So share this, whoever, whoever you are, wherever you've been watching, share it when you're done and we'll keep the conversation going forward. And that's all she wrote. Take care.